I'm joined now by Penny Wong, who's the Shadow Minister for Foreign Affairs. She joins me now. Senator, welcome. Uh, good afternoon. Good to be with you, Patricia. Does this meeting offer the realistic prospect of a, of a reset in US-Russian relations, or is that too ambitious? First, I think that a number of the observations that Stan made were actually very, very good and, and very astute. Uh, I don't want to, you know, comment on what outcomes of the meeting might be, but I think it is instructive how the US president has gone about uh, publicly uh, approaching this summit with uh, Mr Putin. Uh, he's doing so on the back of the G7, where obviously very close engagement with allies and partners, uh, reaffirmation of the importance of NATO, uh, a, you know, the reaffirmation of the importance of a liberal rules-based order. Uh, and he has also publicly messaged about his engagement with allies and partners as to what should be on the table or what should be discussed uh, with Russia. I mean, there are many aspects of Russians, Russia's behaviour which are deeply uh, concerning. Uh, obviously, the treatment of Mr Navalny, uh, obviously, uh, the approach Russia takes to cyber security or cyber, cyber issues and ransomware. Uh, these are all issues uh, that you know, I think the international community are concerned about. Um, so it will be, I think it, uh, it will be, we will look to uh, the way in which uh, those matters are progressed at this meeting. Penny Wong, from Australia's perspective, what would a positive outcome from this meeting look like? Well, we, we, we obviously, you know, the, it is still... Uh, Russia and the United States uh, are two key players uh, in terms of you know, the arrangements around nuclear weapons. Uh, um, we also know that uh, Russia uh, yeah, is on the has has been implicated in a lot of cybersecurity issues, uh, and having some arrangements around that are things Australia has continued to assert. The US president does plan to raise that issue of cyber attacks that you've mentioned, which have mm. affected businesses even in Australia. Mm -hmm. How much progress should we expect here? Well, I think you're asking me to comment on outcomes of the meeting, and you know, I think it's always risky for politicians to do that. It's probably OK for Stan to do that, but not something I can do. Uh, this is a domain in which we have to keep pressing, um, both uh, as Australia, uh, as a, an ally and partner of the US and other nations. You know, this is uh, you know, a domain that is, uh, I think, underdone in terms of national security preparedness. It is a domain in which Western democracies have, or liberal democracies uh, and nations, sovereign nations around the world need, will want to become more resilient in. Uh, and uh, there is more work to be done both at home, but also in terms of international norms. Senator, what assurances should Scott Morrison be seeking from the French president about the contract to build Australia's new fleet of submarines? Well, it's a very good question. Uh, you know, Mr Morrison's known for all announcement, no delivery, but despite uh, uh, backgrounding and uh, the people that there was going to be a lot of discussion about them, this, these issues, there was no announcement, so I hope there was actually a discussion that might affect delivery. Look, the reality is this is a... Uh, we're in real trouble uh, in this project, and, you know, I say that without any... You know, without any joy at all in terms of Australia's national security. That is deeply concerning. We are... Uh, years late, we are billions of $40 billion over budget, uh, many years late. Uh, and even on the current trajectory, you know, we, ha we will at best have seven out of 300 submarines in the middle of next century in our region will be Australian. And that's based on a decision the government still hasn't made about, you know, re refurbishing and uh, the Collins submarines. So this is a project which it is unsurprising that there is a plan B being developed by the Defence Department. Uh, it's a project which this government has mismanaged uh, at years in, uh, and we are still at a point where uh, we are having to have conversations with between the Prime Minister and President Macron in order to try and get the, the, mm. the project back on track. Should Australia start thinking about buying an off-the-shelf submarine design, given the capability gap that we're facing? Well, I, I think it is reasonable for 
Uh, oh, it's unsurprising that the Defence Department confirmed in estimates to me that uh, they're working on a plan B, uh, given where we are. No, uh, it's certainly um, uh, very much behind schedule, there's no doubt about it. Do you believe, though, that the proposal to extend the life of the Collins class submarines is viable? And, and does Australia have any other options? Uh, well, we, uh, uh, that is one step that should be taken, and I think that's clear, that if you look at the advice, look at the questions, the answers to questions that I and other Labor senators have been asking for years, that a life of type extension for the Collins submarine is a necessary step. Uh, it's not the only step, but it's a necessary step, and uh, yeah, I am actually bemused as to why this government has still not made that decision. What are your concerns around the 108 Afghan interpreters still waiting for visas to come to Australia, given what we know is happening, a deteriorating security situation there? Well, the end of your question really demonstrates the urgency, doesn't it, Patricia? I mean, the, the security situation is rapidly deteriorating. Uh, we know uh, the sort of risk that uh, those Afghans who have worked with Australia and other partners face. Uh, we, we, under, we know that uh, these uh, visas should be fast-tracked. Uh, these are friends of Australia. They, fa they uh, have put themselves and their families at risk for working with us, uh, and we need to look after them. And I ha raised, I'm pretty concerned by the, the, the passivity uh, with which this is being approached by members of the government. Uh, I think we have an ethical obligation uh, to people who assisted us over many years. Would delaying the closure of our embassy in Kabul have sped up this process? Did we move too quickly? Well, I can only respond to what I'm advised by officials or what officials tell me, uh, that you know, the security advice was such that they needed to do that. But this was a foreseeable, a foreseeable uh, issue that we had to have a solution to. Uh, and that we're still in the process of processing visa applications when we know what is coming and we knew what was coming does seem to me to uh, pre pretty risky. Uh, I'd urge the government to, to fast track these visa applications. The immigration minister yesterday when granting uh, this move uh, to Perth for the, uh, the Biloela family mm. said he was concerned that allowing the family to stay permanently in Australia could restart the people smuggling trade. Is that a risk? I don't think this, this family is a risk to national security. And I think that you know, having seen so many coalition MPs and senators also calling for them to go home to Bilo uh, really demonstrates that. I do have to say that the lack of compassion on display here, and particularly by Minister Andrews seeking to diminish uh, the illness of a four-year-old girl has been pretty poor. It's a pretty low, pretty low episode, I think. What did Minister Andrews say that you found um, well? I, I thought I thought I, I found it troubling that you saw a federal minister, um, by her comments, uh, suggesting that uh, the illness of a child was less serious than had been reported. I, I don't think that's that's helpful to this situation. It does say something. OK. Um, there are others who have suggested that the parents have used the kids as political footballs. What's your thoughts on that? Uh, I think that sort of language in this sort of situation is really um, disappointing. Uh, you know, we've got a, a family who's in this difficult situation. We've got a, a sick child in hospital. I don't think they're a risk to national security. Uh, even can you know the, the national MP who cover, you know who's the member for their electorate says they should go home. You know, I think the government should just 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 do the right thing. Just finally, very um, unfortunate news today: the the collapse of that ceasefire in the Middle East mm. between Israel and Hamas. Was that inevitable, given there was no real effort to address the underlying tensions between the two sides? That it was a matter of time. Well, I think we all, and no more so than the you know, Israeli and Palestinian peoples, are regrettably, you know, we keep seeing a cycle of es tension, escalation and violence. And, you know, 
that will that has to if there is to be a in, and a just and enduring peace that cycle has to be ended uh, and the the only way in which that can happen is if leaders from all sides are prepared to do so but it doesn't look like they're prepared to do so do you see the change no. in the Israeli leadership leading to any shifts on this Oh, look, uh, let, let's see, you know, where, where the, the new government, uh, when all of that is resolved, uh, heads on this. But what I would say is I retain the view, uh, as does Labor, that a, a just and enduring two-state solution is ultimately the only peaceful uh, and viable outcome for both Israeli and Palestinian people. Just finally, and I know this is totally not your portfolio, but I do want to cover it off with you, um, and that is the minimum... Just in case. Well, it's really important. It's the minimum wage decision, yeah. the Fair Work Commission's decision to lift the minimum wage by 2.5%. Is that a, a reasonable place to land? Oh, look, you know, we, we always have to accept the outcome of the tribunal, though I would say it may well have been more if the government had actually made a submission in support of uh, higher wage increases. Uh, and it, it won't address some of the fundamental problems in our wage system. It won't address those workers who, are, who don't get the benefit of the minimum wage, those workers in the gig economy, for example. Uh, nor will it address those workers who aren't paid as they should be, not uh, you know people who experience wage theft. And of course, you might recall the the very the extraordinary approach this government took when it when it took its own wage wage theft provisions out of its legislation uh, because it was uh, so angry that it couldn't get the the rest of the legislation through. And I think that act of you know, that ch childish tantrum will have an effect on, on so many Australian workers throughout the country. Just one other issue, because you have been pursuing it in Senate estimates previously, and that's in relation to the Four Corners story on QAnon, um, a friendship mm. that the Prime Minister has. Mm. Uh, government ministers, I mean, obviously the Prime Minister's overseas at the moment, but government ministers have been asked and, and they say he's denounced QAnon and their, and, their, and their views, he's not associated at all. Does that satisfy you? The question I would like answers is why for two years did the Prime Minister refuse to answer any questions on this? So you say he's now denounced QAnon. He, he's failed to before. Um, but more importantly, and you know, it's a good thing that he's denounced that. But more importantly, these questions have been asked for nearly two years. Questions about the association, questions about what we know now, you know, Mr Stewart's own boasting as to how he managed to get the Prime Minister to change his speech. Now, that may or may not be true. The Prime Minister should be clear about that. What I find um, really striking about this is, yet again, we see the Prime Minister simply refusing to answer simple questions uh, about uh, his uh, friendship and what it meant uh, and uh, in a particular whether or not you know that the speech was changed at Mr Stewart's request and I think now that that is all on the public record it's pretty reasonable for the Prime Minister to be asked to respond to that. So will Labor be pursuing that when the Prime Minister's back uh, in the country? Well, I, 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 you know, I, I don't know what the House of Representatives do in their question Convenient. time. I've got my own question time to, to resolve. But what I, I would say to you is I think Australians expect you know, their leaders to provide clear answers when things are put to them. Um, you know, obviously, Mr Morrison's entitled to have his friendships, but as a leader of the country, he's also, I think, obliged to ensure that um, some of those issues uh, are responded to openly and transparently when they're raised. Penny Wong, thanks so much for your time. Good to speak with you.